Timothy John Stafford, Michael Leary here. Welcome to the Voxology Podcast. We're so delighted to be a small part of your life. Hello, greetings, welcome. Timothy, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you, Michael? I'm doing great. Although, Timothy, timestamp this, pickleball uh -oh. injury. Ooh. I I think I blew a hammy today. So I had this little tight spot in the back of my leg. You know, I'm shucking, I'm jiving, I'm out there. I'm 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 fairly dominant over the uh, seventy and eighty year olds that I'm playing with, and um, and then I went to jump, Timothy. I, I I jumped, you know, two inches off the ground, easy, um, and uh, I felt that spot that had been tight. I felt that spot say, "I'm I'm done." I don't know if it popped, but it Aww. it there was something that happened, Timothy. And you've never been comforted until you've been comforted when you're the youngest person at the rec center <laughs> by, by every older person who's just doing great coming up to you and saying, hey, do we need to call anybody? <laughs> it was like, no, I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay. Moons but over yeah. my hammy. Moons over my hammy. Great Denny's reference. Ah, oh! and the fact that we can even remember what that is in reference to is, you know, I, I couldn't name another thing on Denny's menu outside of like pancakes, but moons over my hammy, done. <laughs> done. It's because we had so recently, we played a show and then we went to a bar afterwards and the bar allowed <laughs> us to bring food in and there was a Denny's across the street. Oh, and so somebody done. went and bought like seven moons over my hammies and brought them in at like one in the morning. There, you know, it yep. was pretty good. It golden. was slapping. It was slapping slapping as they say as they uh, say so i'm playing hurt today tim well, so time stamp that. that eerie playing hurt today that's how it is these days you can hurt yourself getting out of bed dude middle-aged white dudes talking about their colonoscopies <laughs> that's our new <laughs> get in there that's our new series right there good lord i know it was tight and i was stretching it out and, and you know, I mean, it's not like pickleball is the most aerobic of sports. I mean, it gets you, it, you, get, you move a little bit, but evidently jumping was not on the menu today. So I was telling you, one of my friends that's a nurse, she was saying that in the ER, like the number of injuries for folks from pickleball is like has climbed near the top of the right. But how, what's the average? And, I what think are it's the older. average ages of those folks? I don't that's know. The, I think it's older. That's the humbling part on on all of this, Timothy. Is I'm I'm cooped up on the end while the eighty year old women that I was playing with are just <laughs> just having a field day. So that was no good. Anyway, anything, it's, Tim. What I need to hear from you are two good things about the world that make you optimistic or hopeful, because we distinguish those. Optimism and hope. We distinguish those two things today. <laughs> Timothy's positive, um, positive uh, pearls of purpose. Tim Stafford. Well, I'll give you a couple that I texted you in the last couple of days. That that interview with Nick Cave. I really appreciate yep. listening to people talk about grief and death in a in a positive kind of way. Not as though yeah. those things are necessarily positive, but what they mean to the human experience mm -hmm, mm -hmm, we've talked mm -hmm. about here a lot on here about um our weird relationship with death which as folks yeah. who have the belief system that we have yeah. it seems odd that we would have such a weird like relationship or disdain for death or i don't know not very hopeful yeah. in the death department yeah so that was really encouraging and actually i, I like this uh vice That's presidential the nick candidate cave. nick cave yeah? i do Stephen i think Colbert. he's the Tim Walls guy is pretty hopeful and um, has done a lot of cool things in his home state. And he speaks very hopefully about things and how he wants to bring some of that to mm -hmm. America at large. And America. I find that encouraging. See, there you go. Well, well done, Timothy. Now, now name one thing that uh gives you reason to doubt the two things everything else <laughs> <laughs> time stamp that tim's despair <laughs> yes yes there's there's a guy who uh is on on twitter 
And he is, he, he, I don't know. I, I tend to think he is very aware of what he's doing. And so he is a professional troll, but evidently he had, um, exaggerated his pastoral credentials, uh, in some ways. And so had taken a year off of social media and, you know, was leading like a, 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 a little church or whatever. Um, but then he, he was back this week and as, as it was, it's just so great. I mean, I don't even know that he means it, but, uh, but the, the, the dust up in, in, as a result of his, his return. So he returns and he's now part of a different church or they merge churches or something, but, but he was showing, um, the flyers that they're handing out for their church. All right. Oh, so, I saw this. oh, it's so great. It's so great. I mean, you could not, if you were paid as a professional troll, you could not do this better. All right. So, so I, and I hesitate to even give it, but I just think it's, I don't even take it seriously at this point. It's like, oh my goodness. So on the front of the flyer, um, there's a, there's a little icon, a, a window with a, a cross and a crown in it. And, and above that, um, is this text. This, this is a text list, smiling wives, obedient children, loud singing, strong handshakes, young marriages, good manners, biblical preaching and reverent worship. And I thought Yeehaw. that, that is, that is amazing. Smiling wives. I dude, I'm in, uh, obedient children done. Loud singing, eh, I could take that or leave it. Strong handshakes, yeah, because I'm a man. Young marriages, <laughs> so so does that mean the marriage itself is young or the people in the marriage are young? Because you could have somebody who's been divorced four times have a young marriage. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Good manners, as defined by who. Um, and then I love that we we're going to mention preaching worship. And then the, the guy, he gets obviously, you know, it, <laughs> All the people giving um, energy to this is just the dumbest thing in the history of the world. But the guy then, you know, says, well, okay, here's the other side of the card. And it's where Christ exalting gospel focused verse by verse preaching, conservative theology, reform doctrine, classic and modern hymns, biblical families, which is so interesting. Biblical families. I, none of the biblical families I know are nuclear families. Um, real discipleship, committed fellowship and anti-woke. So, um, I just thought, I thought, speaking of things that make me happy, I was so happy. You could not, <laughs> you could not troll, um, uh, some sensibilities harder than leading with smiling wives. Trolls and, are done. Like this stuff has gotten so far. Oh, you know, like when we send each other articles, it's like, is this the onion or is it I know, not? And I it know. usually isn't. It's usually I an know. actual, like. I just think I, I just think nothing about husbands. I mean, I love that it's no. it's smiling wives well, and obedient children. We're assuming that's for the the whole flyer seems like it's for I, men. Well, you think? Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it just I, I don't even I don't even have anything to say. It just is so beautifully speaks for itself, and it's like, yep, of course it's anti woke, of course. Um, so that's what I'm hopeful about. I am hopeful that we live in a culture where people are free to say dumb things. And um, I mean, I'd rather live in that culture than anyone else. Um, Timothy, today, we're going to do a little more Genesis. <laughs> we're going to talk about firm handshakes and smiling wives. Speaking of smiling wives, oh. here is Eve being deceived by the snake. <laughs> that was quite a okay. transition. Yes. <laughs> Speaking of firm handshakes, here we go. <laughs> Obedient children. Cain and Abel, not so much. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think this part of Genesis is O for all of those. So yeah. we'll see. Um, when we last left uh, the Adam and the Eve, um, we we met a snake, and the snake had tempted. And we're going to talk about who the snake is uh, uh, in a later session. And um, Adam was right there with her. And so they each eat of the fruit. And, and the serpent was right. Their eyes were opened. 
Um, and in defining good and evil for themselves, they now become aware of shame and vulnerability, and they go from naked and unashamed at the end of chapter two to now in the text we're going to look at naked and ashamed. And um, man, it, you could not, oh, I don't know if you could, but it seems like you could not pick a more poetic picture of what humanity was intended for versus the reality to oh. we inhabit than going from naked and unashamed to naked and ashamed. So I'm going to read the relevant text this morning, timestamp text right here. Then the man and his wife heard the sound. Now it's interesting. Wife is the word that's used here. The man and his wife. Um, because remember, they've now become one flesh in some, in some way, at least, you know, in the chronology of the literary account. The man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from him. Now, usually, this is such a weird, such a weird, like, jumble of English words. So they heard the sound of Yahweh God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Now, if we look at the words individually, um, we, we don't get a really super clear picture, but when we look at the words together, as we'll go through them, we get a, we get a, a little different picture than what I'd always imagined. So the word for sound um, is the word for voice. It can be used for the words of voice. When it's applied to Yahweh, it's usually when Yahweh speaks to his people and is often mistaken as thunder. Hmm. So, so sound applied to Yahweh isn't just he, the man and the woman were hearing leaves crunch when it was three o'clock in the afternoon. Like there's a little more to it than that. Even the word walking, the picture of Yahweh walking, it's interesting. Walking later becomes, if you walk with Yahweh, it becomes like the highest compliment. Like, like Enoch walked with God and then God took him home. Um, Noah was a righteous man. Noah walked with God. So like the image of walking with God is, um, it, 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 it's a vivid image in two directions. In the first, it's God's approachability, even though he is holy and he's, you know, he just spoke the universe into existence and somehow he's approachable, but also of the participation God is desiring from the human, right? That, that, Wait, when we walk together, we're both doing something. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's this, I mean, these are such beautiful, beautiful pictures. So, so to walk with Yahweh means to uh, be righteous, but also to have intimacy with Yahweh. Um, but then we get this, and, and, and that would be, you know, okay, here's the sound of God walking in the garden. That would be poetic enough. But when you add this phrase, the, it's in the wind of the day, not the cool of the day. The better translation is in the wind of the day. Hmm. And when you add sound slash voice, um, uh, walking or appearing, and then you add wind, the only other time that combo of words is used is when God appears to Israel at the top of Mount Sinai in, a, in lightning and thunder and a storm. And the people are so afraid, they like refuse to go up to the mountain and say, Moses, would you please do that? So I don't know. I mean, the, the, some of the scholarship I was reading suggests that, that you get kind of Yahweh in a whirlwind here. It, it's not He's an approachable whirlwind, if that makes any sense. And it holds together these, these dual pictures of Genesis 1, where he is the great king above all and separate from all and yet creating everything. And then in Genesis 2, he's the intimate sort of king where he's forming and shaping things with his hands. You get both images put together in this sort of approachable storm. Yeah. Um, it's just an interesting, it's just an interesting picture where. I always picture, yeah, it's five o'clock and, and the wind is picked up. And so Yahweh, this is when it's not too hot out. So Yahweh goes for a stroll. Um, <laughs> and you're like, okay. And, and, you know, I mean, I'm open to the possibility, but, but this paints a picture. I think that, that could be a little more um, congruent with his 
imminence and his transcendence both. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so it's just an interesting, he's just walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> but this time, the man and the woman, they hide from the Lord God. The Lord God called to the man, where are you? The man answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. So I was afraid, naked, and hid. That, that, that triplet is going gonna, is gonna to be present later. Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some of the fruit from the tree, and I ate it. And the Lord God said, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. Now, this, this is an inter in interesting juxtaposition between the dialogue from between the serpent and Eve and the dialogue now between Yahweh and the humans. So Yahweh speaks 10 times in Genesis 1. Now he's going to speak seven times, and three of those seven speeches are questions. Where, what, and who? Uh, which, is, which we'll explore in just a little bit. So Yahweh speaks 10 times in Genesis 1 to create. Now he speaks seven times to address the problem of disorder that's now been introduced by the talking serpent. And so in 3.9, you get Yahweh uh, called to the human and said, where are you? 3.11, who told you you were naked? 3.13, what is this you have done? 3.14, Yahweh said to the snake. 3.16, and to the woman, Yahweh said. 3.17, and to the man, Yahweh said. 3.22, and Yahweh said, look, the human has become like one of us. Now, just by way of, because Tim is a literary genius. That's right. Um, uh, this this card. Well, yeah, timestamp, literary genius. Um, one, of the, one of the things that's interesting about God's question, where are you, is, is you know, some people are thrown by this. And they're like, well, did God really not know? And <laughs> this is obviously a poetic device. Um, Gordon Winham, in his magisterial Genesis commentary, puts it this way. The question, where are you, is rhetorical. Where is often used in this way in poetry, and there are a bunch of examples throughout the Old Testament. And a very close parallel is found in Genesis 4-9, where God asks, where is Abel your brother? And that is followed by, listen, your brother's blood is crying to me from the land, showing that God knows perfectly well what has happened to Abel. Just as a parent who sees where his children are hiding may shout, where are you? In effect, inciting them to come out, God does the same thing. We can presume that this is what happened here. The couple emerges shamefaced from the trees. Their reply to God's inquiry shows they understood the question not as God not knowing, but rather as an invitation to come out and explain what has happened. So, and, and this is going to be important in just a second. God's questions here, who, what, and, and let's see, where, or what is it? Who, what, where, who, what, that's it. Those are the three. Um, the fact that God responds with these sorts of invitational questions is a really significant tell about God's character. All right. So first question, where are you? The man says, I was naked because I realized I was afraid. And so I hid. So big picture, we've gone from naked and unashamed and now naked and ashamed. And we, we, and we see this shame in multiple dimensions. On, on the one hand, they've covered themselves um, so that they look like the fig trees. Um, the, uh, on the second hand, they've covered themselves from each other. And then on the third hand, to press the metaphor beyond reasonableness, <laughs> on the third hand, they've now hid from God. So the text doesn't say they're naked and ashamed, but it shows us that they are. And what did you say last week that the, when they put on the fig leaves, they're imaging the trees? Right, right. The, uh, the imagery is you become like that which you image. Yeah. 
So because they took of the tree, now they dress themselves as trees in response to their yeah, shame. So interesting. It's so interesting. Now, the problem that, that we're dealing with here, and we'll keep saying this over and over and over and over, is, is not that these two are damned to hell and are in need of salvation to heaven. The issue that we'll see, and, and it's just, it's, it's like explored just ad nauseum throughout the rest of the Old Testament, particularly in Genesis, is that the humans are no longer imaging God. They failed at their vocation. And we've said this a thousand times, but how you begin, how you conceive of a story's beginning uh, will determine what you think the story is about and how that story will be resolved. Right. So the issue here, again, I know we get original sin from this, um, and we call it the fall. Um, but but I, I think the idea is a little more radical than that. It, it's the idea that that they they didn't just do something that God said not to do. It's that in doing that, they grabbed a hold of something that God had for them, but on his terms. And in so doing, imaged part of creation rather than the creator. Right. And that, that's the issue. That's what has to be restored. And so just making that point uh, yet again, how you begin determines how, why, why it is that Jesus is coming and what he's coming to do. Notice also, we're just making general observations. Notice the nature of the invitational questions. So God's questions, um, who, who told you, where are you, right? And then what was the third one? <laughs> I keep forgetting. What have you done? What did you do? Yes. Where are you? Who told you? And what is this that you've done? This is exactly how we act with our children. Right? At our best. Them in, yeah. Well, when you're inviting them into those conversations to figure out, to involve them in understanding rather than just yelling. I mean, think about, so, so God has been presented in, in pages one and two as someone of unimaginable intelligence, someone of unimaginable power, and someone who is interested in these dust creatures for some mysterious reason. And of all the ways that God could respond to the most calamitous thing that could have happened to these two, he asks questions that are designed to draw them out of hiding and connect him with him, mm -hmm. which blows my mind. I don't want to, I don't want to skip over that part because again, if, if you're new to the Bible, these foundational texts are saying so much about what God is like, right? It's not just that he's brilliant and powerful and that he's desiring participation and giving away power and authority to his creation. It's that his response isn't to obliterate the man and woman and start over. It's not to, um, to curse the man and woman. We'll get to what he does in a second. Um, and those are often understood as curses, but they're not. Um, he doesn't uh, add to their shame. He doesn't yell at them. Like, I mean, of all the ways an ancient mind could conceive of that, a God of such power reacting, you know, to such calamity, who, where, and what, mm -hmm. and you're absolutely right, Tim. If, if we are in good places as parents, instead of overreacting, jumping to conclusions, right to punishment, we, we begin by evoking conversation um, so that the truth comes out. They step into the light and they restore their connectedness to us. I mean, that's, that's how image bearers relate to each other. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And so I just don't, I never want to, I never want to go beyond the idea that, that in talking to a, a man that will be named human and Eve, who's named mother of all living or living one, right? They're real people and they're also representatives that God doesn't still respond to me the same way. Mm-hmm. So any picture of God that has God um, flipping his lid uh, towards me when I when I make 
similar mistakes. Um, I don't know is very accurate. Now, people will counter that and say, yeah, but look what he does in, in the covenant context. And I'm like, yeah, in the covenant context where he explicitly tells you these things are happening because of your disobedience, it's okay to draw that conclusion. Yeah. But in the new covenant context where there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, right? We are explicitly told that the way God reacts to our sin is through grieving. Right. And you can imagine what confession turns out to be is just us coming out of hiding, mm -hmm. getting rid of our fig leaves right in front of each other. I mean, it's interesting. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. That you might be healed. It's fascinating that we take the fig leaves off in front of each other, that somehow that's the same as taking the fig leaves off in front of God. I mean, that's really a really reversal well, of the very human that we need to participate in understanding where we went off track so that yes. we can better build the muscles to not do that again. And that doesn't happen through just discipline. It happens through an open invitational conversation. Like if I want my kids to, you know, do X, Y or not do X, Y, and Z again, they're going to learn that through participating in a conversation that asks leading questions or whatever, however you want to phrase yeah. that. But you can just yeah. see how human that whole thing is. Or how godly that whole thing is. Sure, yeah. I mean, that's, I just, and that's why Jesus so often, I mean, more, you know, some have estimated it's like he only answers three questions directly, but he's usually answering questions with questions. Yeah. Because the goal is participation. Yeah. And it's not power over, it's power with. Yeah. And so, as my therapist has said, when you're making statements towards somebody, you're in trouble. When you're asking questions, you're on safe ground. I was like, hmm. Hmm. So, Tim, what do you think of that? Um, <laughs> Why don't you tell me what I think? <laughs> yes, exactly. But that's funny, too, because we talk about that all the time, too, about how many people just want to be told what to think. And we can, we've seen how that has created a lot of problems yeah. in current society. Rather yeah. than learning how to think and why, we just want to be told, this is what you think, here you go. And this is modeling exactly the opposite of that. Right. Like, it's modeling participating in understanding the question so that you understand the answer better. Yeah. 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 Exactly. It means what good therapists do. It's just, but it's just interesting. Here's a 6,000 year old document that presents God as God, a God who blesses a God who makes a God who delegates a God who invites like it's, I just don't want to move on totally beyond be, be, and, and yes, when we're dealing with Israel, I get that picture gets muddied. Yes, absolutely. I still think it's the same picture, though. Um, it gets absolutely clarified in Jesus. When Jesus is marching around looking at his disciples going, why are you guys still afraid? You know, what? What? what is going on? I mean, it's, it's such a similar sort of deal. Anyway, um, the big thing I want to hit on, we got a question about this, is something called the fear of the Lord. Because it says, this is the first time someone is afraid of God. I was afraid, so I hid. And um, and and we're going to get to what the fear of the Lord means kind of in Proverbs, but it's actually references back to this moment. So here's the question I got, uh, or that we got, from Maple Ridge, British Columbia. Boom. How cool is that? Better than Auburn, California. Or Nashville, Tennessee. <laughs> My question is simple. What does it mean to fear the Lord? I know I desire deeply to understand it like Proverbs 2. And I have read several blog articles dealing with this exact question. I tend to mix the ideas of restoration, justice, and equity in my mind with my ingrained version of a terribly angry and punishing God. And I've learned that fear of sin is different than fearing the Lord, but the two of them are so intertwined in my psyche that it's taking some real work to unlock them. I don't want to search the internet until I only find the answer that I want to hear, self-affirmation. I seek wisdom to know how just and righteous God is and how that intersects with God's all-encompassing love. So yes, I said my question is simple. Perhaps that is an understatement or a lie. Sorry about that. So genius genius question and it, it came in um right when i was looking at this idea of of the humans being afraid when adam says i was afraid so i hid 
And obviously, um, there is a baseline uh, intensity to God encounters that fear is a, a useful word to use. So you, uh, you get Moses or Elijah or um, Ezekiel or even John when he sees the risen Jesus in his full glory and falls down before him as though dead. Like, or anytime an angel shows up in the, in the Bible, the first thing the angel has to say is, do not be afraid. <laughs> Right? The first thing every time an angel shows up, as far as I know, do not be afraid, do not fear. So it's not, and I've heard people, oh, preach this. It's so cheesy. They'll say, listen, 365 times God says, don't be afraid. So every day of your calendar year, God is saying to you, don't be afraid. Hmm. Nope, that's not what it's saying. This is this is about when you encounter something so beyond you and your finite brain's ability to comprehend. Don't be afraid. I'm an approachable whirlwind. Is kind of the idea, right? So, <laughs> so when we talk about being afraid of God, in in one sense, that is that is like a totally sensible idea. If God is like one eightieth of of what the Bible says God is like, then we would be fools not to absolutely freak out if we saw the tiniest bit of God's glory, right? When I stand before the Grand Canyon, when I'm in the middle of a thunderstorm, when when um, you're in uh, nature in, in in such a magnificent way, so as to remind you of your smallness, like words that we use for that moment is reverence or awe, respect, but there is a meaning of fear that includes that kind of um, semantic domain, where um, I am I am engaged in something that feels so much bigger than me. I have a physiological reaction and emotional reaction to it. So, mm -hmm. on the one hand, the the fear of God makes total sense to me, um, because I I. I, I can't even fathom what it would be like to see that kind of holiness or have a vision or whatever. You know what I'm saying? But when, when he, now I think when it says Adam was afraid and I hid, and then the phrase fear of the Lord, I think there's something else that's happening too. So one very straightforward meaning is re reverence and, and respect. We have a healthy respect of, of the Lord. Yes, absolutely, totally agree. But it's interesting because the fear of the Lord gets paired in Proverbs with what? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of? Wisdom. Yes, Timothy. And, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil represented what? Wisdom. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Remember, she saw that it was good for wisdom. Mm -hmm. Right? So, so. God and Tovin Ra, remember the knowledge of Tovin Ra was talking about being morally naive or not having wisdom or discernment. So this is all a riff on the Genesis 3 thing. So the so Adam, or in, well, he's the one that's answering, but in this case, the man and the woman, they eat of the tree and they are afraid, right? Um, and who knows? I mean, they were afraid of God's largeness. They were afraid of the consequences. They were afraid... They didn't even know that they were afraid. They just knew there was something happening that caused them to fear. Who knows? But when, when you get to Proverbs and the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, the, the wisdom word is a play back on the wisdom that, that the tree of Tov and Ra versus the tree of life, that choice between the wisdom to obey God and draw near to him and not eating from the tree or the disobedient choice of, of taking upon yourself the definition of the of Tov and Ra, right? Cultivating your own wisdom apart from Yahweh, right? So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And, 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 and what this wisdom, first of all, is uh, applied skill. It's, um, it's not knowledge. It's, it's practical. It's, uh, I, I think the same word is used of the two like crafts, craftsmen that are named at the end of Exodus about contributing to the tabernacle. They were filled with, hmm. and that same word wisdom, I think is used. It, me, it literally means skill at living in God's good world. And so here's the choice. 
between the the man and the woman the choice is be, between the the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and um the tree of life and that is presented as whether or not you will allow god to define tov and ra for you which is wisdom or you will do it yourself which is folly so what gets pulled through to proverbs is the fear of the Lord is a relational idea that means including him in my definitions of wisdom rather than excluding him, which is the height of folly, right? Trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him. He will make your path straight, right? This is, this is another way of talking about that same dynamic. So fearing the Lord isn't being afraid of the Lord. It's including God's wisdom um, in your moral choice making versus excluding God's wisdom and just de defining Tobin and Ra by yourself. Does that make sense? Yeah, it unlocks so many other things too. <laughs> well, John Collins um, from the Bible Project podcast, he, he made a point, uh, I, and I heard this a while back, but he was saying how... Um, that the fear of the Lord draws you to Yahweh. The, the idea is if I fear Yahweh I, and I'm sitting here like Joseph and I'm, I'm sitting in front of a massive temptation, the fear of Yahweh means I turn to Yahweh for wisdom as opposed to defining Tov and Ra myself, right? Mm -hmm. So Joseph's a great example. Here's Pharaoh's wife. He, he you know, he, uh, Joseph says, how could I dishonor Yahweh uh, and flees? And so that's fearing Yahweh. It's not that he was afraid of Yahweh or afraid of the consequences, but rather he trusted Yahweh's wisdom over his own. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, there is, I think, a part of fearing consequences too, but I don't think that's what it means to fear the Lord. I think the fear of the Lord is something that draws us to him because he's wise and good and for us. He wants our flourishing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do you think the shame, though, is part of... Like they became ashamed. Do you think they became ashamed because they had the knowledge of what they just subverted? Or great question. You, I have no like the idea. shame becomes a byproduct of so it is associated to the fear because it's like they went it's like they abandoned I'm trying to truncate this to a smaller question, but <laughs> anyway, go on. Well, I just I was thinking about how much of like the thing that you read with the postcard for the church mm -hmm, that, that you mm -hmm. read at the beginning. And yeah. um, the thing that I texted you guys last night about the pastor going off about how women shouldn't vote and that's biblical and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And I was thinking about that in shameful ide ideologies because how much the church, some parts of the church and these examples of that partner in this idea of making people feel ashamed. Mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so it's almost like they're partnering in the serpent's mission, but through a church mm -hmm. publication. Does that make sense? Like we're, it's sure. like we're, we're pushing people away from a healthy fear of the Lord into the shame department mm -hmm. by like, Hey women, you shouldn't even have thoughts and let alone, right, should right, you right. be able to vote or do anything or have any autonomy? And then men if you're not masculine in this very specific way, there's so much shame tied into those things. And we've yeah. experienced it in our own different ways, but it's like, it just feels yeah. so counterintuitive to what yeah. God's trying to do. And it almost seems like we're doing what the serpent <laughs> was doing. That's it. That, exactly. Exactly. Right. The, the serpent, obviously we find out later is someone called the Satan, the accuser, which is yeah. literally just the word for accusation or accuser. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, absolutely, the, the, the best accusations um, always have God's authority behind them, right? In terms of the best meaning most harmful, Yeah. because um, how can you argue with that? And it's interesting, shame, and this is where, this is where I think the fear of the Lord, when, when, I've, when I've walked with Yahweh, or in my case, Jesus, Yahshua, long enough, the fear of the Lord also includes the knowledge that that sin is its own punishment. In other words, the shame wasn't introduced by Yahweh um, to the man and the woman. 
the shame resulted in the simple act of disobedience. Mm -hmm. And they, and shame was then a moral judgment. They didn't make moral judgments prior to this. They just trusted the word of Yahweh. Mm -hmm. So the first moral judgment they make is shame. They're yes, naked. They're reward. And that is the consequence. Now, obviously, Yahweh is going to speak the rest of Genesis 3 in a way that describes the world that you and I now inhabit. So we're going to curse the serpent, and then there will be consequences for the field and the woman in childbirth, which we'll talk about what that means. That doesn't mean labor pains. That's a much bigger thing. But the point is that baked into the way Yahweh made the moral universe as image bearers is that obedience is its own reward and disobedience is its own reward. And, um, and so, you know, when we years later try to jazz up Jesus and say, you know, listen, man, when you're obedient, you get blessed and you get rich and you whatever. Or we we add extra shaming and extra accusations, right? We really are doing in both cases, we're doing the serpent's work. Mm -hmm. Right? We're still we're still imaging the serpent to one another. That's not what Yahweh is like. Yeah. Um, and so yes, it's fascinating. The idea of shame, and and this this gets into my whole therapeutic journey. Shame has been such a constant companion. I never knew what, what it was to not have it. Me too. And, um, and it's such, it's, it's a word and a concept that of all the ways to describe, again, the, the intimacy between the man, the woman, creation, and, and Yahweh, to be naked and unashamed, to go from that to now naked, hiding, blaming, um, and shamed, man, that, that speaks to me personally, like yeah. that, that, that story tells for both of us. Shame you know I mean? is so binding. It like, it literally binds you up like it, mm -hmm. and it makes you want to be like isolated and stationary or well, like immobile. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's like, like you yeah. want to hide. <laughs> yeah. It's just, it's incredible from God and from each other. I mean, it's just, and so much of, of what Jesus was doing and then the spirit invites us into is the unbinding of that. Yeah. You know, when he, when he, when somebody gets healed by Jesus, often he will, he will retitle them or remind them of their identity. So like the, the woman that had the issue of blood for 12 years, in a way she stands for Israel. Um, in another way, she stands for herself as a real person. It's interesting when she touches the hem of a robe he, and he acknowledges this, he calls her daughter. Daughter, your faith has healed you. Daughter there is, a, is an announcement to the community that she is now restored back mm -hmm. as a daughter of, of Israel. Or even with Zacchaeus, truly this man is a son of Abraham. Like, so, so, so much of what Jesus was doing was restoring the false identities you know, um, into true kind of true identities. And I don't mean that in a trite self esteemy sort of American way. No. I mean, like in the deepest way imaginable, he yeah. takes shame and does something with it. And usually tells them to go like, it's not a, yeah. it's not the period on the sentence. It's like, well, he gives them something to do. Yeah. It's like the like leper a, go and tell the high priest, exactly. Go and sin no more. Go and, and, and tell of the mercy God's had upon you. Like, Again, it's participation. Man, it's so but, frustrating that the church has partnered so much in the shame game rather than that. Well, yeah, because if you were not shaming, then we could be condoning sin. And, um, you know, and, and, and again, I, I've, I've, in my conversations with notorious sinners, including my conversations <laughs> with myself, <laughs> I have very, very rarely ever had to convince somebody that they were sinful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. I never had to say that. Now, religious people, on the other hand, we're a whole different story. Um, a mentor of mine years ago said, immorality is the worst way to hide from God. <laughs> um, and morality is the best way to hide from God. So our fig leaves as Jesus people, our fig leaves are religious in nature. Well, look at how much I pray and look at, I'm not doing that. And at least I'm not those people over there. Right. And so the whole invitation of Jesus to come out of hiding 
Yeah. But coming out of hiding means confronting the roots of shame and being honest about them. Man, that's a whole thing. A couple other small points. Um, Cause we could camp forever, but I mean, I just, the fact that all of this is in the first three chapters of Genesis just blows my mind. I just, you and like, we both, like, as you said, therapy, such a big part of it has been shame, getting rid of this passenger that has been there forever and has like caused anxiety and depression and different things. Um, I guarantee there's so many people in this audience who are just like buried mm -hmm, under mm -hmm. shame. So that idea, like to come out of hiding, like it's like, it's yeah. almost like the first and truest form of repentance come out of it. Let's reposture ourselves and move and go. Yeah. Rather yeah. than just like, well, that's what confession, hide. Exactly. That's what confession does. That's confession exactly. gets a bad rap too, I think, or maybe not a bad rap, but a, maybe a misdirected rap. And I think it gets turned into things like either penance or mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. our weird, yep. bad versions of accountability partners that we've had <laughs> th for our whole lives, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It always turns into like, well, I did it too. So I guess we're kind of in the same, but I don't know. It, it, right. The motive behind confession has been really warped. Yeah. And so I, I feel like confession then gets more linked into shame rather than yeah. a yeah. way out of shame. Yes. If that makes sense. Oh, it totally does. That's why, like, what what is the one of the first steps of the 12 steps is a ruthless, you know, moral inventory. And it's yeah. like telling the truth. There's no a more lot in there too. Dude, no more distorting, no more minimizing, no more justifying. Just tell the truth, tell the truth. And then when you, when you tell the truth and people are there and they still want to be connected to you, knowing the truth, Mm -hmm. that's when the healing, remember the opposite, my, the opposite, my therapist, the opposite of shame is connection. Mm -hmm. So when G, when, yeah. when, when, when God invites them out of hiding with his questions, right? There's almost this cosmic like connection being placed on the table in front of them. And instead of, instead of saying, I'm sorry, I failed. We blew it. Have mercy. Um, they blame and, and, uh, you know, I mean, how many stories in, even just in Genesis are going to take place where the man blames the woman, mm -hmm. you know, that, that where the helper, where God's great gift gets blamed for the man's failure, right? Abraham's going to do this twice. Um, Isaac, his son is going to do that because he saw his dad do it. Like you just, mm -hmm. you just like. Even the blaming there of the woman, this <laughs> woman the, you gave me. I mean, yeah. oh, it's the beginning of generational trauma. Just it well, started a long time ago. <laughs> it's the first. It's the first patriarchy. I mean, it's the mm -hmm. first move towards power over and hierarchy right here, right out of the gate. The woman you gave me, right? Literally, right so, out of the gate. Literally, <laughs> right out of the gate. And then the last thing, and this is a really important, but small but important point. Uh, and this is from Tim Mackey. Um, so, so Hebrew didn't have vowels. It, I mean, it doesn't have vowels. It has, you know, scribbles and dots and, but those weren't original. Um, uh, those came later in the evolution of the Hebrew language, according to my understanding. Hebrew. So Hebrew has a lot of words that are spelled the same, but are pronounced differently and have slightly different meanings. And one of the examples I always use is lead or lead, mm -hmm. right? L-E-A-D, I have a lead pencil. L-E-A-D, I'm leading my dog through a walk in the woods, whatever. Um, Hebrew has a bunch of these. And one of the things that Mackie points out is that the word for where, that's that we translate, where are you? That, that mm -hmm. first word, where are you? is the first word of the book of Lamentations. Um, and there's an ancient tradition that sees what Yahweh is about to do next, not as cursing, but rather as lamenting over, because the only thing that gets cursed is the serpent. The man and the woman do not get cursed. But it's like, like Yahweh is now lamenting the consequences of what, what has happened 
of imaging now the serpent and the chaos that that's introduced. That's going to, that's going to affect the male female relationship. It's going to affect the, the female's um, ability and comfort in fulfilling her fill and fill the earth and subdue it role. And it's going to affect the man's ability to fill the earth and subdue it too. And so like their vocation, because they're imaging something that isn't God, their vocation as image bearers is affected too. And that's what needs to be addressed in the coming of Christ. Boom. Boom. It's so, so good. Ladies and gentlemen, so good. Look at that. 47 minutes, ladies and gentlemen. And by the way, for the 70% of you that still might be listening, Tim and I want to say thank you in so many ways. First of all, thank you for, we've gotten some of the most generous, kind, thoughtful, uh, affirming emails in the history of our little operation here. So thank you that you guys take time to write those. Also, we have this whole community of people who financially support this thing, which continually boggles our minds, and we're so grateful for it. Um, and we have a whole group of people that kind of oversee the financial integrity of this thing and are with us in sort of, um, you know, keeping it uh, uh, above board because Tim has a gambling problem. And um, and th that maybe maybe that's coming out of hiding. Tim, you want to talk about that at all? I'm not ready yet. Okay. After I have my uh, big win. Tim <laughs> he gambles with his hair color. And Seth Eery still, still Boring. disavows. Um, so anyway, it, it like um, I'm continually reminded of what a privilege this all is. Timothy, last words, go. Same. I really want to invite people out of hiding. <laughs> I feel like that's the key feature today. Yeah. Feel a tug for all the people who are feeling like buried by shame and don't feel a way out of it. Not that we're the way out of that, but. No, no, we are most certainly not. But there is something. There is something about it. And that yeah, might be worth exploring. I mean, I learned a lot. The, the, I went to this six and a half day intensive um, four or five years ago on sexual integrity, but it was even, it was just a much bigger picture than that. It was, it was amazing. And it, it and it was, and I was um, scared, humbled, um, all the normal things you would feel as people are talking to teddy bears and you're walking around doing things you don't normally do. But there was a talk that was given on shame that uh, I, my, my body reacted as if like mm -hmm. jolted with electricity and some of the most, uh, powerful, some of the most powerful freedom. I was able to name something that I've not been able to name ever that was buried in there. Yeah. And, oh my Lord. And so there is, um, to Tim's point, um, there is an, there is an other side, uh, to this. But feeling worse about yourself, hiding more, um, again, the, the, the issue isn't you have to announce it to everybody, uh, but there's a difference between secrecy and privacy. Mm -hmm. And so secrecy means no one knows. Privacy means the right people know. Right. And, um, and that is one of the hardest. I was, uh, that is one of the hardest things um, to believe is that there, there are still people who would love you and want to relationally connect with you. Oh, totally. Yeah. On the, I mean, it's, it's crazy too, as we side. talk about like what it means to be human in all these different ways, the, the physiological and physical effects that shame have on your body are mm. so profound and so intense. It is so anti-human. Great, great. It just point, hurts Tim. you. And then yes. you hurt those around my wife and I were talking about, um, just that cliche of breaking cycles, right? Like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. hurt people, hurt people, healed people can heal people that yeah. cliche and breaking those cycles of being like, instead of perpetuating hurt, because I've yeah. been talking a lot to my therapist about anxiety, obviously, but Mazzy is starting to like show a lot of this anxiety and a lot of these things mm. I'm getting tools in my forties to start 
dealing with that. I'm trying to give her tools at eight so that she yeah. does not have to go through life in yeah. this in the same way. And so it's like just looking at all those little cycles that we've been given yeah. as falsehoods that we were told were true right. and breaking those so that we can, you know, I, I feel like that is gospel ministry in a way, like just letting people, showing people, equipping people to not, to lean into what humanity is supposed to be rather than all the crap that we've been handed and mm -hmm. told is truth. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know if people are listening and they feel like they're stuck under a shell or hiding in the trees or whatever. Oh, I bet, I, of course but, there are. Oh my goodness. Tim, you are such a great pastor, dude. You are, you have such a pastor's heart. I love that. I know. I know. I know. Can't deny it. Anyway, we love you all. You can't deny me. We love you all. What's that? It's a Pearl Jam song. It is. <laughs> it is. Anyway, friends. Bye. Bye. <laughs>